I'm Bob Costas, and welcome to Blood, Sweat, and Glory, a review of the games we play. Sports has been one of the biggest growth industries of the past century. With television, we've come to spend more and more of our leisure time watching sports. Out of concern for our health, more of us are playing them, too. Meanwhile, rights fees, player salaries, ticket prices, everything is up. It's the era of the million-dollar-a-year utility infielder, the billion-dollar TV contract, the three-dollar ballpark hot dog. Money has at times been a corrupting force. The media intrudes, and under the ever-hotter glare of the press army, stars can be born in an instant and then burn out overnight. Bigger is not always better, but the pull of the games endures. The drama of competition, the ever-present possibility that something transcendent will take place. For many of us, there has come to be something essential about sports. Everyone needs to find some place in life where the child can walk, wrote the poet Donald Hall. I need, Hall wrote, to leave behind my own ambitions, struggles, and failures. I need to enter the universe of the game, where conflict never conceals itself, where the issues are clear and the outcome uncertain. In sport, Hall continued, I enter an alien place, or the child in me does, and the child plays for a little while. Sport is in our blood. It's found in the ancient records of the earliest civilizations. It exists in every corner of the world in countless forms and varieties. It's part of every culture, a shared experience, a universal language. Sport touches all of us. It's a record of human history, a mirror through which we can see ourselves, our past, our present, and possibly our future. It has compelling drama and exhilarating passion. It's the stuff of dreams, the Olympic Games, the World Cup Final, the Super Bowl. We gather in the cathedrals of sport to see the legendary competitors, to witness the wonderful moments, to touch the hem of greatness. We're inspired by the celebration of sport, every one of us. Sport is also about competition, the will to win. It's about commitment and making a supreme effort. We see it in the athletes we idolize, the anguished face, the straining sinew, the quivering muscles. We admire the victory because we understand the pain of training, the desire to go faster, higher, stronger. Sporting success is greeted by widespread public acclaim, but it's only achieved soaked in the sweat of years of dedication and training. Sport allows us to dream, to dream of glory, to score the winning goal, to cross the line first, to make the winning run. We share the tears of joy, the delirious laughter, the ecstatic laugh of honor. When the winner raises the trophy in victory and dons the mantle of greatness, it's a moment all of us can embrace in the blood, sweat, and glory. In the brightly lit ring, man is an extremist. Boxing has become the tragic theater. It is the drama of the flesh.
it's a love boxing. It's a love. It's something that you'll never forget. Uh, I think you're going to die with it because it's always been there. Um, to me, as being a fighter, I walked it, talked it, acted. The most popular Western fighting sport is boxing. The sport that can be described as both and noble. The champions of the modern men are the life. However, of all the giants of boxing, one man stands head and shoulders above all the others. The most charismatic figure in the history of sport, Muhammad Ali. I am the greatest. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Patrick Marcellus Clay. He's young, he's handsome. They know it. He's a poet, a prophet, and many people believe he'll be the next heavyweight champion of the world. Cassius Clay won the great title from Sunday in 1964. Nothing would be the same again. He's the one who gave a lot of others who are not quite so courageous the, the courage and the temerity to, to plow ahead. He changed his name, changed the course of boxing, and changed the face of sport forever. His victory against George Foreman in the Rumble in the Jungle in 1974 to the heavyweight title never be forgotten Another by anyone who right saw it. His commanding presence as a boxer gave him a platform uh, from which he could speak in a way that uh, I don't think any other athlete has spoken in my lifetime. Boxing also is what I use to reach my plateau in life, which is, they say, the most recognized man in the world. And this is just what I need to do it all on this faith. He inspired everybody. Mohammed is bigger than black. He's bigger than white. He's a champion forever. No one can describe in mere words the pleasure derived from the Olympic Games, the prowess and stamina of the athletes, the beauty of their bodies, their incredible dexterity, skill and strength, their courage, endurance and tenacity. For 1,500 years, the sporting ideals of ancient Greece lay dormant until Frenchman Pierre de Coubertin in the late 19th century founded a new gilded youth by recreating the Olympic Games. The Olympic movement is now the guiding light of the world of sport. Ever since I started running, and was old enough to have a perception about what the sport was about. The Olympic Games was the only thing you ever wanted. After the Second World War, the Eastern Bloc saw sport in the Olympics as a way to enhance their international prestige. They set up schools to nurture the best talent and came to dominate a whole range of sports. But the area of greatest success was in the Olympic Stadium itself. In Everything. In the sprint, the explosion. 
I had the attitude that no one could beat me. I also had the feeling that I would not go in and try to break a world's record. I would be more interested in being a recipient of a gold medal. In Mexico City, Bob Beeman produced a performance which has been described as the most memorable single achievement in the history of the Olympics. The curtain was getting ready to go up and the audience was sitting out there and I was getting ready to put on the best performance of my lifetime. Oh, it's an enormous one. My goodness me, it's an enormous one. That surely got to be a little bit better. The measuring device is, of course, a little bit too short, and we had to bring in a manual tape. And uh, I was not familiar with meters. And um, about 30 minutes later, uh, they said that I jumped 29 feet, two and a half inches. And when they mentioned that to me, I was just completely um, flabbergasted. He had broken the world record by nearly two feet. It would stand for 23 years. Beeman's performance was a once in a lifetime thing, but on the track, one man seemed to stay at the top forever. I had the confidence and believe I can beat anybody. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to, because I'm going to lose races. I have, and I will. <laughs> you know, that's just life. But I had the confidence to know that when I'm at my best, I can beat anyone. As a child, Lewis idolized Jesse Owens. In Los Angeles in 1984, F. Lewis won his many subsequent achievements make him the greatest sprinter jumper of all time. Health, happiness, harmony, friendship, and fame are the fruits and rewards. The moment in history when a crude ball was first hit with a stick is lost forever. But a stick and ball game was played by the ancient Egyptians over 4,000 years ago. It has hundreds of descendants. One of these games has now become one of the world's most popular sports. The home of modern golf is St. Andrews in Scotland, the Royal and Ancient, but in Augusta, Georgia is held the world's greatest tournament. This is the tournament they look forward to, the Masters. It's the spring of the year, and it draws the biggest crowds of any event. It's too bad there's not room for 200,000 people. They'd fill it up. In the late 50s, a legend came charging down the fairways, Mr. Charisma on the pond. As a young man starting out, I wanted to win golf tournaments. I hated to lose more than I thought about winning. So uh, uh, if there was a, there was never a plan for uh, a charge. It was just the fact that I might be going to lose. Palmer's swashbuckling style has made him golf's most idolized player. His faithful fans, Arnie's Army, followed him everywhere. He won seven major championships, including four masters in seven years, and did more than anyone in the history of golf to generate its mass appeal. Palmer's playing achievements were soon to be overshadowed by a young man who had come to be called the greatest player ever to play the game, the Golden Bear, Jack Nicklaus. His record of 18 major titles and 45 top three finishes is unlikely ever to be beaten. His last title holds a special memory. Throughout most of my career, uh, 
I expected to win when I played, and uh, the other players expected me to win, uh, the public and the press expected me to win, and none of those four expected me to win in 86. <laughs> Bobby Jones once said, Mr. Nicholas plays a game with which I am not familiar. In the 1986 Masters on Bobby Jones' own course, Nicholas, at the age of 46, played the last 10 holes in 700 par to overhaul the field and win by one shot. It was one of golf's most emotional times. The unique appeal of golf is encapsulated in a moment, the moment of challenge, to stand on the 18th with a testing putt to win the championship and hold your nerve. Eye and judgment are sure in seeing the ball and gauging the court. The game is less subject to chance than others, more disciplined, more skillful, and so more perfect. It's played in arenas like those of ancient Rome. Its stars have become the gladiators of modern sport. But tennis is only the most precocious member of a large family crowd. In 1968, the open revolution in tennis had brought the professionals back into the sport. A year later, seven years after his amateur Grand Slam, Rod Laver won the first open Grand Slam. Tennis was transformed once again during the 70s as players got younger, flasher, and richer. Borg's icy Scandinavian appeal elevated him to pop star status. He was also the greatest player of his generation, winning six French titles and five successive Wimbledons. His center court encounter against the material John McEnroe in 1980 was one of the greatest matches ever played. Borg retired at his peak, aged only 25, but the irrepressible Jimmy Connors seemed to go on forever winning titles in the 70s, 80s, and still fighting in the 90s. Championship, Connors. The modern player has to be a complete athlete, and Martina Navratilova is the supreme example. The Australians made an art of being in physical shape, but uh, back then they didn't have the knowledge of what it takes to be a complete athlete uh, as far as what you're eating and other exercises that you besides just playing tennis. And I was the first one that really took it a step further from the tennis court and uh, tried to do other sports and, and uh, make myself a complete athlete. Now, they're all. Modern-day gladiator offers great rewards of fame and fortune. Tennis academies throughout the world seek out the best. For every Capriati or Celis, there are thousands of others whose dreams are killed in the heat of the battle. It took Monica Celis four years to graduate from a 12-year-old hopeful to Grand Slam champion, but she is a rare and exceptional talent. While many players aspire to be the best, the mind of greatness is worn by only a few. Tennis is basically whoever handles the most adversity the best. You can be out in a tennis court, it can be 100 degrees, it can be windy out, there can be sun right in your eyes as you're about to serve. There can be people screaming at you, umpires making bad calls. There can be all types of things and negative distractions going on. 
And the person that handles that the best and, and continues to play their best tennis and focus and believe in themselves, their own confidence, their ability to play, those are the people. That separates the good from the great. Soccer's appeal is such that it ignores race, religion, and politics. It has one real goal, to create friendship. It is the beautiful game. In Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, they built the world's largest stadium, the Maracanã, in homage to soccer. It can hold 200,000 worshippers. Ademir, Garrincha, Sico, Brazil's great hero, are revered as in a pantheon of the gods. But one in particular, like Zeus, is Father Canal. From 1958 until 1970, Pele, Brazil, placed the golden age of soccer. In 1970, in Mexico, they won the World Cup for the first time. But in 1978, the Canary Yellow Confetti, in honor of Brazil, was overthrown by the Blue and White tribute to Argentina. Argentina's win in 78 was not an isolated success. They had always been a power to rival Brazil and Uruguay. But a young boy from the slums of Buenos Aires would bring Argentina an era of unparalleled success. Diego Maradona, 1986 in Mexico was his finest hour. Of all the world's great games, soccer touches the hearts of the greatest number of people. It is the people's game. From its humble origins in the villages and streets of Europe, the beautiful game reminds us all of the importance of playing the game. Baseball is the very symbol, the outward invisible expression of the drive and push and rush and struggle of a raging, tearing, booming 19th century America. Don't the ball. The hitter swings at the arm motion. Into deep left center for Mitchell. And we'll see you tomorrow.
It's been said that if you want to understand America, you must first understand baseball. It's called the national pastime. It's played on fields of dreams. Every little girl, every little boy, and every grandmother and grandfather plays that game, holds a bat in their hands, swings it, and tries to hit the ball. I say that baseball is not only the number one game in our country, it is the best buy in town. blossoms with the warmth of spring and throughout the long hot summer millions of americans take themselves out to the ball game as they've done for the past 100 years by the 1960s the major leagues had spread from coast to coast Of the great achievements of the era, perhaps the most remarkable was Hank Aaron's capturing Babe Ruth's home run record. His final total of 755 will never be broken. It had taken me 23 years to establish that record, and players don't need to play that long anymore. You know, they make so much money in four or five years until they don't need to be bothered with uh, playing as long as I did. Now, of course, a whole new generation has joined the ball. is the pitcher, and no one has been more spectacular than Nolan Ryan. The night he struck out his 5,000 victims is one to remember. I think that because of the fans' involvement in it and their support and the excitement and the electricity that was in the air around the stadium made it very meaningful to me that so many people got involved in what was really a, just a personal accomplishment. When the umpires signaled strike three, all of America celebrated Ryan's achievement because all of America understood its magnitude. Everyone could share the fulfillment of his dream. The long history of baseball is a mirror of American history, and like America, is constantly changing, but it never forgets where it came from. In Chicago, old Comiskey Park has been torn down, but next to it, new Comiskey, bigger, brighter, and better. A new field of dreams for generations to come. Baseball is a piece of Americana that nobody can ever take away from, uh, from this country. We've had stupid commissioners of baseball, stupid owners, stupid general managers, terrible players. But the game keeps prospering because the game is the thing. seen the wind, neither you nor I. 
but then the trees bow down their heads. The wind is passing by. There's one sport that is not only overtly American in style, but also has a 100% all-American pedigree, basketball. been a major sport at the colleges. The annual college championship, the NCAA Final Four, is one of America's greatest sporting spectacles. In the professional game on the West Coast reside the glitzy and glamorous Los Angeles Lakers. The Forum has become the place to be seen, even if you're a superstar in your own right. The first on-court superstar was 7-foot, 1-inch Wilt the Still Chamberlain, who once scored 100 points in a single game. He helped take the Lakers to their first NBA championship in Los Angeles in 1972. Then came Kareem. As Lou Al Singer, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar had thrilled L.A. crowds at UCLA. He continued where he left off with the Lakers. And finally came the man known universally by his nickname, Irvin Magic Johnson. It was an era of hype and sky hooks as the Lakers won five titles in the 80s, two of them guided by their inspirational coach, Pat Riley. It was also an era of hope. It's okay to have big dreams because they can come true if you work hard and dedicate yourself. And uh, I'm, I'm a prime example of that. I had a lot of dreams. I was poor, but I worked hard to get to where I am today. Basketball players have been called the world's greatest athletes. Superheroes like Julius Irving, Dr. J, and the Philadelphia 76ers, who revolutionized the game around the basket, and Michael Jordan of the Chicago Bulls. The man who it seems can do anything, he can fly. Basketball is getting bigger as slam dunk and is the worldwide vocabulary. Basketball is now one of the world's most popular sports. Not bad from a beach basket in Springfield, Massachusetts, for just a hundred years. Hockey captures the essence of Canadian experience in the new world. In a land so inescapably and inhospitably cold, hockey is the chance of life and an affirmation that, despite the deathly chill of winter, we're alive. When winter descends on North America, things can get pretty tough. So can its winter sports. The first major hockey championship was the Lord Stanley of Preston Cup. The game's home was French-speaking Montreal and Quebec. It would be North American sport in French connection. Good. 
Montréal pour toute la population de la Montréal pour la entire population de la province de Quebec, et especially pour le Montreal Canadiens. C'est comme une religion. In recent times, there have been outstanding players. Bobby Orr of Boston, Montreal's Guy Lafleur, and Chicago's Bobby Ho, the ageless Gordy Howe, Mike Bossy, who took the New York Islanders to four Stanley Cups, and Mario Lemieux of Pittsburgh. All are stars, but only one man refers to as the great one, Wayne Gretzky. Like many Canadians, Gretzky learned his hockey at home with his father during the long, hard winters. It seemed as if he'd been born on the ice, and he was skating at the age of two. As a professional at the previously unheralded Edmonton Oilers, he helped create a new hockey dynasty. Gretzky has become the personification of all that is good in the game. The strength, the speed, and the skill. The great one of North America's great little game. Probably, you know, the fastest sport on on the face of the earth. Uh, as far as doing everything at high speed, it's very physical. It's very demanding. You travel a lot. Yeah, it's tough, but it's also a great life. Everything I have in life, I owe to hockey. I've never known a man worth his salt who, in the long run, deep down in his heart didn't appreciate the grinding discipline. There's something in good men that really yearns for the harsh reality of head-to-head -head combat. There is no substitute for winning. I know that's a cliche, but we must win. We will win. Win is the name of the game. It's been said that baseball reflects how Americans see themselves in sport, but that football epitomizes what they really are. Like. I think American football is primarily a way of life because it's a sport of being knocked down, getting back up, pulling your strap tighter, and going on for that position. American football originated in the Ivy League colleges, but no college has enjoyed greater success than no design. Top college players graduate into the professional game, a highly complex battle of wills masked by a brutal facade. I've always believed that the game of football is to be played as violently as possible, and if you can't do that, then I don't think you belong in the game. The defense is the immovable object in football. It follows the Lambert maxim that championships have won on defense. Some teams have built their reputation right. The Chicago Bears have always been renowned for their power and have achieved success on a pile of sack quarterbacks. But no matter how powerful the defense, some men seem to find a way through. The marauding knight of the offense is the running back. Not many athletes have the combination of strength, speed, and guile required to be a top-class runner, but O.J. Simpson is one of them. I got the ball, 11 guys are trying to get me. I have 10 guys, actually nine, because the quarterback's not blocking or anything, who are trying to protect me, you know? And I got to figure a way through this, <laughs> you know? And there's a spontaneity to running the football, you know? You get the ball, and it's you against them. 
the best runners become legends. It was once said of Jim Brown that Superman wore number 32 and played in Cleveland. A top runner in full flight is one of the most exhilarating sights in football. This is Marcus Allen's 74-yard run in the L.A. Raiders victory in Super Bowl 18 in 1984. But if the running back is the knight in shining armor of the offense, the quarterback is still the commanding general. I think part of it's an instinct, and part of it you have to work on. Part of it you have to know and understand that the offense and you have to know where everybody is you have to know what adjustments are going to be made to the routes uh, against certain defenses and, and that just takes time few quarterbacks have fully mastered these complex strategies those who have become the all-time greats like broadway joe namer football's first pinup who led the new york jets to their sensational win in super bowl three in 1969 and Roger Staubach of America's team, the Dallas Cowboys, the master of the last gasp play. Roger would never accept the fact that he was defeated. So he was a remarkable player. And he won so many games. 24 times he brought us from being from behind to win football games. And 12 of those in the famous two minute. And that's what made him so unique. He just never quit. It was a quarterback who inspired the team of the 70s. Terry Bradshaw and his Pittsburgh Steelers. They won four Super Bowls in six years, though they had an occasional stroke of good fortune. In a 1972 playoff game against Oakland, Pittsburgh was losing. Bradshaw's desperate pass was deflected into the hands of Frank O'Hara. He won the game for Pittsburgh and will be remembered forever as the immaculate reception. The team of the 80s was also molded around the quarterback, the boy from Monongahela, Pennsylvania, Joe Montana. The draft took Montana to the West Coast, to the San Francisco 49ers, where he built a reputation which may mark him as the greatest quarterback of the night. He's like a, a green beret when it comes to playing football. A guy's outstanding. He's definitely going to go out all time, you know, the best quarterback ever played this game. Montana's breathtaking last minute drive to bring the 49ers their third world title was the fulfillment of a personal dream. But it was also a dream everyone could share because it is an American dream. You can't ask for a better way for a quarterback to win uh, the Super Bowl. You know, coming down to the last second, throwing a touchdown pass to win it. I mean, that's, you make, you dream about those things and have that opportunity. Everybody in professional football wants to be in the Super Bowl and win the Super Bowl. We won the championship against Miami, and it was the greatest feeling that you can have in sports because you finally reached the top. Two teams going head to head, that competition going back and forth, is that's what America's all about. Human beings have been equipped with a wondrous range of creative movement. Motion is a basic element of life, and sport is the milieu wherein we express our physical genius. The fundamental underpinning of all sporting success is strength. Strength is force in action. It's the dynamic power exerted by the muscles of the body that is used in different ways in nearly every sport. America's most perfectly developed man, Charles Atlas, became the first modern-day He-Man in the 1940s. No one needed any longer be a 100-pound weakling. By the 50s, bodybuilding was growing in popularity, and tempting specimens were never short of admirers. In more recent times, it's the Austrian oak, Arnold Schwarzenegger, who's taken bodybuilding to the realm of cult status 
not only for he men, but also for he women. Hello? Who's that? The best illustration of strength in its purest form, where strength is exerted at its near maximal level, is in the sport of powerlifting. Here, raw power is translated from huge bulk to lift enormous weights. The strength used in the free weights of weightlifting is a different kind of strength, an ability to exert power at speed. And it's women who are currently breaking most of the barriers in this sport. American Karen Marshall was a pioneer in her sport in the late 70s when it was still considered inappropriate for the female body or temperament. There were virtually no other women even interested in the sport. She first competed as a super heavyweight weighing 230 pounds and challenged all the preconceptions about femininity. I thought I was big and beautiful, but not too many other people did. Um, it, it's difficult to be 230 pounds in this society because I knew I was an athlete and I knew I was in great shape. And I like people to think I'm in good shape, but not a lot of people thought I was in great shape. They mostly thought I was just big. Women are now joining strength sports in increasing numbers to issue a forceful female challenge to the power of the male giants of the past. The ability to endure is the second vital ingredient of sporting success. The Tour de France has been called the toughest challenge in sports. 23 exhausting days, over 2,000 grueling miles. In a race, pain is something you can't easily explain. It hurts to breathe, your muscles ache, but everyone suffers. A champion's strength comes from the ability to go further into pain. At that moment when your legs are giving up and you can't breathe anymore, you have to be able to push even further. It used to be the rider who dominated the mountains won the Tour de France. Now it's the all-around talent, like three-time winner of the race, American Greg Lamont. If you win the Tour de France, they expect you to win the next race immediately. There's no, there's no forgiveness in cycling. Now in Lamont's wake, a fresh generation is pushing its ability to endure even further in the hard and unforgiving world of cycling. The human body has been described as an incredible machine, as well as strength and endurance. It can express great beauty. It can be a physical art form, the beauty within the beast. I think most of all that it's beauty. The audience doesn't come to see the rehearsals. They come to see the performance. I 
и двата са от много голямо значение за художествената гимнастика, защото без едното не може другото и без другото не може. Без балета не може да има атлетизъм. Most sports are judged by results, but in gymnastics, a subjective assessment of how the result is achieved is important. Gymnastics is a beautiful sport. You need to be a, a good in acrobatics. You need to do ballet. You need to be graceful. And the, most, the, the third important part is the perfection. The three parts together make a gymnast a star. Star quality is something admired in all athletes, not just admiration for the winner, but for the winner who wins with style and panache, who wins well. Olga Korbett knew how to win well. When I competed, I just loved the audience. I wanted to give myself to them completely, and probably that's why they responded so well. Corbett captivated the hearts of her audience and inspired millions of young girls throughout the world to take up gymnastics. But beauty and perfection in sport doesn't come easily. You need to work. To win without the work is impossible. So whatever you do, you need to work. You know, as, as harder you work, as good as you are. Sport is usually highly competitive and uncompromising, sometimes harsh and unforgiving, but occasionally it is simply beautiful. Only an activity which is a matter of life or death, or in which death is at least a possibility, is in my opinion an adventure. Gentlemen, start your engines! race car go around the racetrack and you hear that noise and you smell the rubber and you smell the burning oil and when those motors crank up at the start of a race if your blood doesn't start pumping there's something wrong with you For many seeking challenge and adventure, speed is the passion, whether it's speed on wheels or speed on snow and ice. Of all the winter disciplines, Alpine or Nordic, the most admired in the blue ribbon of skiing is the downhill. The most notorious and challenging of all the downhill courses is found flowering and above the Austrian town of Kitzbühel, the infamous Mannenkamp. We did the first time there, why? When I saw the piece have. for the first time, I, I said, no, it. I won't go down. This is it's too dangerous. Or, uh, this, this, this is not crazy. It's the classic downhill race, the one you have to win if you want to be remembered. Of all the courses, the Hanenkamp is the hardest. The Hanenkamp is the hardest. Probably the most difficult and certainly the most dangerous downhill of them all. But for the courageous skier prepared to accept the challenge awaits the ultimate thrill, that of the downhill. But 
as adventure sports for all become more accessible and controlled, the modern-day pioneers and explorers are pushing ever nearer to the edge of danger. They are the real risk-takers, just for the thrill of them. Their commitment is total, and just their life. It's an impossible quest, almost an absurd adventure. You're always looking to break barriers, but there is a physical limit. If you keep skiing 65 degree gradients, one day you'll luck will run out. If you're not interested in doing previous skiing slopes, one day you're going to go too far. It's evident that we're very motivated for doing the first ones, and that for that, one day we're going to go too far. Through the eyes of the real risk takers, anything can be seen as a challenge, just for the thrill of it. In the world of extremes, there are no rules, no inhibitions, and no room for regret. Welcome to the Outer Bank. In sports, it's not only the acts of greatness we remember. As vivid, too, for each of us are the smaller moments. The first trip to the ballpark, the first glimpse of the vivid colors and special ambiance. Particulars aside, there are some general truths that help account for the enduring and ever-growing popularity of the games we play and watch others play. First, sports may well be society's single greatest common denominator, cutting across lines of background, gender, income, geography, and the rest. Second, as we cope with and largely accept the vagaries and ambiguities of our own lives, sports offers drama with clear-cut resolutions. And for the most part, sports are fair. And perhaps most simply and compellingly, sports make us feel. Thanks for being with us.